the hot mic here on the Outlaw Nation uh, channel here. One of the first uh, bonus episodes we'll be doing through December to whet your appetite, give you a nibble, give you a taste of uh, what we've got going on for the Patreon in the future there. Uh, there's a shot of Jeff's crock, crotch there. I am the outlaw, John Roca. Excited to be uh, back together again with this man, the insider himself. Looking very dapper, I must say. Jeff Snyder, how are you? Dapper? Look at Just that sweater. Just wearing a hoodie. Just wearing a hoodie oh. That's all it is. Happy Tuesday, baby. Happy Tuesday, brother, man. How are you feeling? How was your weekend? How are things? I don't normally see you this early in the week, Johnny boy. Um, the weekend was fine. It was pretty uneventful. I didn't do okay. much. I didn't see a lot of people. Oh. Uh, I did play ball and hit a couple three-pointers to, oh, you know, boy, the game go. winner. But, you know, yeah. that's that's neither here nor there. Uh, here we go. Here we go. The tales, the tales of Jess Snyder on the court. You got to love it. Um, but yeah, we are, as I said, this is, uh, we'll be doing, uh, through December, we'll be doing um, some early shows every week, Monday or Tuesday, to kind of give you a little taste of where we want to go with the hot mic. These will be more segment-oriented, less about news, although there will be some new stuff that pops up, of course, like box office or whatever, but mostly focused on segments. And today we're going to be doing our, and reviews, which I think Jeff mentioned uh, when we had it back and forth, like this show could be a place where we do a little more extensive reviews and breakdowns of certain movies because we seem to be rushed doing them at the end of our regular show on thursdays and we will still keep doing our regular show on thursdays or fridays depending on the schedule for sure and today we're going to be tackling a godzilla minus one review we're going to jump into the top five tv show ideas for nicholas cage who has said he is interested in tv and moving into tv now we're going to give our top 10 ridley scott movies as well and we're going to talk early top 10 critics lists and how people feel about that for sure. Jeff tweeting about it. And then me getting into a bunch of battles with a joke I made earlier today on Twitter as well. So a lot to get into, but our stream labs and super chats are open. You love the show. You support the show. Send in your love, send in your support. It's Christmas time. Send in all the things that you want here to support the show. But Jeff, let's, uh, let's start that first place. Everything. Okay. There it's weird there. Um, all right, so let's uh, let's have this conversation of Godzilla minus one. Shall we kick off with that with our review? <laughs> okay, well done, well done. Uh, yeah, Godzilla minus one. This one comes to us from uh, writer director uh, Ta Takash Takahashi Yamazaki, who was also credited as the visual effects guy in this film. This one stars, and please forgive me if I. Stumble on these names, Ryunokuki Kamiki, who plays uh, the main character, Koichi. Uh, his uh, girlfriend is uh, Mina Minabi Hamabe, uh, who plays Noriko. And we've got a bunch of other actors playing certain parts in the film. The kid, the ship's captain, the, the professor, uh, the woman who is his neighbor, who helps out with their child. Uh, all leading to this final confrontation with Godzilla. A film that is two hours and five minutes long. But in, an interesting emotional journey that we go on with these characters uh, leading to that final battle. So, Jeff, your thoughts? Godzilla minus one, breaking box office records for a Japanese import. Your thoughts? Is it really? Wow. Yeah. Uh, I saw it last night, and it was pretty packed. Like, it, my my row was full at, at AMC. Yeah. Uh, I'm surprised I can hear you today because the sound was amazing last night. Oh, wow. It, it blew my goddamn head off. Uh, I thought that the movie was good overall. Okay. But it was better when I was watching Godzilla do his thing and less interesting, uh, you know, with the, with the family drama that was kind of interspersed in between. Okay. What about you? Um, yeah, I have to maybe push back a little bit on it. I think the family element and the character element, the human story to me is the reason why I put this, as, as our friend JTE tweeted about, as perhaps the best Godzilla movie ever, maybe this side of the original, the 1954 original, I really liked the human story. As someone who served in the military, to me, I connected with the PTSD story. I connected uh, with uh, the feeling of um, uh, wanting retribution or wanting closure, uh, wanting a chance to atone for past mistakes. Certainly having that be a part of this, I thought was really fascinating as an angle and as a story. And we should say we will probably spoil a couple of things just to let you know we're not going to spoil too much, but you guys know the general gist of the movie. And so for me, I like that as a, a driving thrust. That being said, the moments of Godzilla were so brutal and unsettling and 
terror inducing a little more of that. I'm not sure that I, I don't think I disagree with you. I think it would have been nice to see more of that, especially when you see him destroy that one city near Tokyo. Um, the family stuff, I just felt it was like a little generic. It wasn't necessarily like the best acted. Like I was just like getting mm. back to the Godzilla stuff and particularly I, I would say the first act was slow. Like the first like 40 minutes, wow. you know, I was Oops. like, I was like, we, you know, get back to the big guy already because this is, I'm, I'm losing patience. And I don't know if that's a budgetary thing. Um, yeah, only $15 million, right? Visual effects I thought were great for, for the money. And I know some people yeah. were calling it cheesy at times, but I feel like that's like, that's a Godzilla movie. It's supposed to be a little bit cheesy. Yeah. Um, I also like that it wasn't, you know, I'm not following Monarch, but, you know, from what I understand, it's just like a ton of monsters. It's like this entire world. Yeah. And I liked that it was kind of just, just this big chunky boy. Yeah. Well, and we've seen in the past and certainly uh, other film critics and analysts of films in the past have said that Godzilla represents you know essentially could be a number of things could be um uh, the nuclear war that happened after world war ii was certainly setting this thing after world war ii the, it seems like that's the angle uh that takashi yamazaki was going with uh was that he represented the birth of nuclear war and the devastation it caused um numerous cities in uh, japan and certainly godzilla the when you see him come back in the movie it is because of those uh, nuclear USA nuclear experience, experiments they were doing in Bikini Atoll, and so he, so you see that it's induced from this place, and the reckless abandon with which he killed, I think, thirty thousand people is what the stats are when you see it in the movie. Um, shows you the, what's that? It seemed like a low figure to me, thirty thousand. <laughs> okay. It seemed like it was more than that, but um, yeah. Uh, I was going to say I really did like the kamikaze pilot stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was again. It was just the other stuff that I was like, eh, move it along. <laughs> you know, someday you're going to meet somebody, actually fall in love, and maybe even have a child, and maybe you'll revisit this movie and you'll connect to this story a bit more. I don't know. I, I you know, I liked it. I thought it it separated it from other Godzilla films. Certainly, better human story than we've seen in almost any of the current uh monster verse films over there at universal so i liked that element of it and i, I thought also yeah, it was it was, a bit... it was better than those because those movies are yeah. like aggressively done yes true, true, they're, true. Terrible. they're just like nothing special and i and i do see what made this special i just didn't i didn't think it, was, I, it wasn't great i can't say okay. it was great well i thought i thought for me it's in my top 15 or 20 of the year absolutely in terms of the Technical expertise, the story it told, the performances, and the direction. I thought direction, although I think in the middle, it got a little too maudlin, like it got a little too emotional, but that could be a cultural thing, like Japanese approach to emotion and story versus the Western-induced uh, approach to emotion and story. But overall, though, I thought the effect was great. I got emotional by the end with the story that was being told with Koichi and what he was going through and the decisions he makes. And um, I, I found, and then I thought the other characters I thought worked really well for what they were, but I hear you. We don't go too deep into any of these characters other than the kamikaze pilot, but, uh, but you know, the, the shooting of it, the cinematography, the direction of it, I thought was really well done, even though there are a couple of moments with the special effects, you're like, ah, that's a bit off, you know? You have to, I think it's just a sign that the rest of the world, right, is catching up to Hollywood and yeah. they're capable of producing blockbuster looking content at a fraction of the price. Now, I'm not saying that they go about that the right way. Right. I know how overworked visual effects artists are in certain parts of the world where sure. there aren't overtime laws, right? Right. And it's, you know, uh, it's, it's obviously very different, but, um, I think you have to hand it to to this director and, and his whole team because obviously yeah. this looked as good as you know any large scale Godzilla movie that costs ten times as much. Yeah, and the thing is, it's uh, it's extended its IMAX run the, after the uh, positive box office receipts over the weekend, and certainly there's not much that would take its place in IMAX. So why not extend its run in IMAX theaters uh, so that people enjoy this film uh, more and more? I would love to go back and see it again. It was. Such a fun experience. So uh, I thoroughly it really was terrific. Yeah, yeah. Would you like to see a second one? 
Yeah, I would absolutely go see another one of those. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Anything more to say on this one? Um, you know, I went to AMC last night. Yeah. It must have cost close to $30 for a movie ticket. <laughs> no joke. I, I bet it costs, and this is on like a, what was it, a Monday night? Monday night, yeah. I bet it costs at least 22 or 23 plus another two or three with the surcharge and tax, whatever. It's probably 25 26 $27. Yeah. Crazy. Well, that's why I don't understand why you don't have the service. It's like 20 bucks a month for AMC or 20 bucks a month for Regal, and you can see as much as you want. I should. And they, they do upcharge. Like, I paid 7 bucks for IMAX, but, you know, it's better than paying $28 and then going to see a bunch of other films. And for me, it works because, like, I like to go see films multiple times before I review them most of the time. So to me, that's the better option. So I would suggest you do that. It's not that much, 22, 25 uh, a month. It's not that much, man, for seeing multiple times. Um, and you could see it for free if you had a Regal one or, or AMC. Or a, I think AMC puts IMAX for free as well if you're paying for it monthly. So it works out. Um, all right. Anything more to say on this? Oh, I thought the score, the OG score, I thought was great. Dun, dun, dun. That kind of stuff was great the way they melded it in as well. I like the score as well. Mm. But it's overbearing. <laughs> Jesus Christ. What's the positive thing? You seem to have liked the movie. Is there anything positive you can say about the film? I mean, I'm just saying the score, it was like, and, and it was almost the first thing that my friends and I said, like, that was a good score when we got out. But yeah, it it, it was just like wall to wall. Like, it, it, they just, it was too repetitive. They used it. Too, they went they went back to that, like, huge too, too often, too much. <laughs> I thought they used it the right amount and not too much. So there you go. Space Windu says uh, Godzilla minus 30 bucks. There you go. <laughs> I like that. I like that. I like that. Um, all right. So uh, like I said, the Streamlabs Super Chats are open. We're trying to keep this to a tight hour. That's our review of Godzilla minus one. I think we both can say, no matter what our concerns are, and certainly Jeff seemed to have more concerns than me, that you should definitely go see this film. Right, Jeff? Would you say that? Yeah, I would definitely recommend it. it like, it, it deserves to be seen on a big screen. Yeah, hundred percent. Godzilla. I mean, Godzilla is like basically the biggest movie character there is. Yeah. And again, that sound, I won't forget that anytime soon. Did you like the design of Godzilla? One last thing. Yes, I did. Yeah, actually, yeah. I really did. Yeah, me too. I like how he looked. I like that he was a thick boy. <laughs> Yeah, when those scales lit up too, I thought that was an awesome effect to see that happening. That I sense like that. of fear like as well. Yeah. Um, all right, well, there you go. Well, let's move on. What do you want to move on to next, Jeff? I already laid out some of the stuff we were going to talk about. What do you want to hit next? I want to draft Ridley Scott movies with you. Finally. All right, let's do, let's do it. Ridley Scott, this uh, Napoleon is out in theaters now. Uh, so how do you want this draft to go, Mr. Uh, Mr. Snyder? <laughs> Thick Zilla. <laughs> you tell me, how many movies should we do? Well, I have 10 currently. Yeah, I have I 10 currently too. And okay. they're probably close to the same 10 as you. So it's like, should probably. we just do like six or seven a piece? Okay, that sounds good. Six or seven a piece. How many do you want to do? <sighs> well, oh, um, can we get to 10? Do you think each? I don't know that we can, but um, okay. hold on. Let me see. You run this thing. I, I ran the last thing. You run this thing. I mean, okay, no, no, no. Let's just do a uh, a dozen movies. We're each going to pick six movies. Oh, we're each going to pick six. Okay. Okay. All right. Are we going to try to pick the same? Like, a, what happens if we pick the same? We're just going to move it up or move it around? Is that is that how we're doing it? Or, or? I mean, are we drafting? Or are we trying to assemble like oh, the mass? I see. We're drafting. That's right. That's what we're drafting. We're drafting, right? Not compiling. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. All I mean, right. one, two. I mean, you can get to like, I guess we could do 10 movies a piece if you really wanted to. Yeah, I think we can get there. All right, fine. Let, 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 let's let's move it along. So what do you want to do? Uh, first first and fourth or second and third? I think did I I think I went first and fourth last time. So I think you should be able to go first and fourth. I'm glad you me. take first and fourth here because to me, there's such a huge discrepancy. So uh, I will run with that. Okay. And I pick us off with the obvious number one pick mm -hmm. of Alien. Alien is Ridley Scott's masterpiece. It is what he will be remembered for. Nothing anyone else says can change my mind. It's one of the okay. great. 
So that means I get the second and third picks. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Right now? Yes. Well, I'm very glad I gave you number one because you're completely off base. Oh God. The number one, the number one should be, but I'll take it at number two, Blade Runner. That's the Are one. You serious? That's the one he's going to be known for. Because are you serious to me right now? Are you being serious? People, people are going to talk about aliens before they talk about alien in the future, but no one is going to talk about anything better than Blade Runner in the future when it comes to sci fi. It's that in 2001 battling for the number one greatest sci fi film ever made, regardless of your protestations. That's the film there. Harrison Ford, Sean Young, Rutger Hauer, iconic Rutger Hauer performance, greatest Rutger Hauer performance ever. This side of Blind Fury, an incredible performance, and uh, a film that is off-quoted. It is my screensaver. It is on my phone, on my computer. It, I will have posters of it on the wall coming up later on this year, or in 2024. So it is my favorite film, bar none, of Ridley Scott. So, But I'll put it at number two because you've got to go first. That is an <laughs> overrated classic. I've never understood oh. it. It was a divisive movie when it came out, first of all. So like, yes, it was. It's now seen as a masterpiece. Mm -hmm. Is like... And maybe sometimes it does take some time, you know, maybe even decades away from a movie. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. But at the time, there were plenty of critics shitting on Blade Runner. Not that they should have, sure. but like Blade Runner is okay. Mm -hmm. It's more of like a vibe. It's a vibe, man. Man, people shit on Citizen Kane when it came out too, brother man. So that's no, that's no. It's critics are no bull. I respect Blade Runner, but is it mm -hmm. a movie that I like go back to and rewatch? Absolutely not. And twenty forty nine. Uh, yeah, see, I put it on right now. And the fact that there are five cuts of it lets you know how much people love that movie. By the way, sure. guys, yeah. coming soon. I, I'm going to figure it out. I got a microphone. Oh, look at that. So I'm, I'm working on it. I'm <laughs> Is it USB it. or XLR? USB, I think. Okay. <laughs> what do you mean you think? I only have one port, though. And Is I it use connected it to your computer? It's like, do you either want to hear me or do you want to see me in this beautiful ring? <laughs> You know they buy things you can connect in that'll give you extra ports, Jeff. The, the chat is lighting up right now, and they're all like, they're all on your side. They're all like pro these Blade Runner nerds. Alien is like one; it's the ultimate monster movie. It is an absolute horror masterpiece. Hmm. Blade Runner, it's come on. <laughs> all right, so then my third pick is uh, Gladiator. Let me take that off the board for you right now. That is absolutely the third uh, best movie on my list as well. Uh, Alien was second on my list, but I had to put Blade Runner there at, on our list. But yeah, Gladiator. I mean, that's a film that still will put the fucking shakes in you when you watch it. It is maybe Russell Crowe's greatest performance ever, or if not, his, mo his greatest, his most resonant. The way he commands those armies, the way he battles for revenge, the nobility and dignity he has by the end. Joaquin Phoenix playing a... a what could have been a caricature mustache twirling villain, he actually gives it more life, more depth, more interesting complexity to it. And of course, uh, Connie Nielsen, fantastic. And Richard Harris's small part in it is great. And the battle scenes are fantastic. Jaman Hansu, the gladiator stuff, all of it. Who knew you could bring back gladiator films in the year 2000 and make it work and uh, lead you to a best picture win. So to me, that film still works and the dialogue still works, eminently quotable. And it's an awesome experience to revisit whenever you watch the movie. Are you not entertained <laughs> by this podcast? I know that should be our that should be our okay, motto. Well, I'm so relieved that you went in this direction, John, because at the mm -hmm. start of this, here's what I thought mm -hmm. was gonna happen. Okay. I thought you were gonna get the first pick. Mm -hmm. You were gonna take Alien. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was gonna ignore Blade Runner. <laughs> then you would get Blade Runner at four. And then you'd have Alien and Blade Runner and everyone would laugh at me on the internet because you'd have both of Ridley Scott's movies. Okay. <laughs> Thankfully, you messed up. Oh, I did. And I, I got Alien. And I'm about to get my number two movie. Wow. Go ahead. Because I don't have, I have Blade Runner at five. <laughs> You're so long. Yeah. Good. You're so long. Uh, my number two movie is Thelma and Louise, which is a great, oh. great drama Gina Davis, Susan Sarandon, amazing, amazing chemistry. And no joke, John, this is how I plan to die. This is how I want to die. This is how I plan to die. If my brothers are watching this, I do not want to die in a hospital or in a bed. Wow. I want you to strap me 
to a convertible. Yeah. Put some tunes on the radio. And I'm going to drive off a cliff. That is how <laughs> Jeff Snyder is leaving this world. Thelma and Louise style. It's It'll always be influential to me in that regard. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, yeah, it gave us Brad Pitt, kind of. So It's a fantastic choice. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, um, if you've ever seen the... You're right, because if you ever watch the story of Gina Davis tells it like Mark Ruffalo, Edward Norton, and I think another famous actor auditioned for the Brad Pitt role. She did the screen tests with all those actors, and it was her opinion of Brad Pitt that ended up getting him booked in the role and won won him the role. So, yes, the film gave us Brad Pitt, and Gina Davis gave us Brad Pitt uh, for sure. But yeah, I love I like the movie, but it's not a movie I go back to all the time for whatever no, me reason. Me neither. So yeah, but I can honestly respect the movie. It's lower on my list, but I honestly respect that you you putting it this high for sure. All right, here yeah. we go. This is your next pick. What are you gonna do? American Gangster. Come on, there's uh, no wow. other way to go. There's no other way to go. American Gangster. Give me a break, break. This film is awesome. American Gangster, the best of Russell, one of the best of Russell performances, but really one of the best Denzel performances. Their chemistry is fantastic. The story he tells here is a story I had, I had no idea who Frank Castle was. And look at the just wealth of black actor talent that he has on the Denzel Washington side of things, which I think, which I think is fantastic. Like there is a, what, um, uh, a I think the Edge of Four is one of the first films you ever saw him in. Great stuff there. Cuba Gooding, uh, really good in the film as well. But the story that's being told and the way they start out as enemies and eventually working together, I thought was fantastic. And so this is one of the best directed, gritty, ground-based Ridley Scott films that he's ever uh, done. And so I put that high up on my list, American Gangster. It is fascinating getting into a window into just how other people, including you, John, look yes. at movies. Okay. Because it really just emphasizes how I look at movies very differently. Yeah. Uh, I think American Gangster is good. Okay. Um, I have it at number six on my list. It's okay. like a B plus movie for me. Okay. Uh, but there's one that you missed, another one. So oh I am, I'm ending up with three of my top four here, and that's The Martian. I will definitely, definitely take The Martian with my next pick. Okay. That's, that is the best of Ridley's recent run of movies. Uh, and with a great performance from Matt Damon and... Um, you know, yeah, science like the that, shit out of it. Ev everything clicked there. That like that wasn't going to win Best Picture, but that was like a... If there were only five nominees, I bet that mm -hmm. movie still would have been nominated. Uh, look, I thought The Martian was great. My problem with it is all the Jessica Chastain crew stuff. Yeah, I get uh, it. It's a little yeah. annoying and then... But then when you, when you find out when they that they cast the Asian character with a white woman with Mackenzie Davis, that kind of uh, plus I think Kristen Wiig is completely miscast in that movie, completely miscast for the role she's playing in that movie. I just I never buy Wiz, uh, Kristen Wiig with any drama except maybe Skeleton Twins. Me, but me, other than that, hundred percent with you on that, John. You you agree? Do you agree with me? A hundred percent. Can't yeah, yeah. can't buy her in a drama. You're right outside of Skeleton uh, Twins. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's so, like, you that. actually remember Mackenzie Davis's like character was supposed to be Asian. That yes. was like a major controversy that flared up. <laughs> I just don't remember that. Like who who holds on to that? Hey, it's all part of the film. But I did like Donald Glover. He had a nice role in the film. And I had no idea what JPL was till I watched the movie. And then when I watched the movie, I did like a whole deep dive into JPL. Pretty incredible stuff they do over there. So, all right. Well, my um, top six are off the board. So right. we, we each wound up with three apiece. It, you are now up. Okay, so we've done, we've taken out Narsh. Okay, so then my next one is a classic war film, one that I got wrong uh, in my final match against Dan Murrow, Black Hawk Down. Black Hawk Down is just a phenomenal film that uh, really puts you through the ringer emotionally as a military guy, knowing this story when I got, when I, uh, uh, you know, was in the service and hearing about it, and then watching how well he portrays the real, um, how can I say this? The real helplessness that you feel as an audience member watching all this happen, watching these young men have their lives taken from them in the most horrific of situations and circumstances, seeing how foobar it can be when the government has involved but can't do one thing or another, and these kids are caught in the middle. Again, 
the fact that they treat uh, soldiers as props sometimes or as numbers on a ledger, as unfortunate casualties because governments can't are afraid to cross certain lines because they've created nebulous reasons for the for why they're doing the things that they're doing. Other than that, it also features an incredible stable of talent that are all still working today yes. to varying degrees. So it is an it's a great, great film. Uh, the cinematography, the score, the visuals of it all, the the camera placement, uh, the composition of the shots, all of it just incredible throughout this movie. Uh, yeah, I, I, I like Black Hawk Down. I think it came out a little too close to some like great war movies like mm. Saving Black Ryan or you know even like Thin Red Line. I thought was Thin Red Line a bit better. Yeah, um, but a great cast and definitely you know I, I enjoyed it in the moment. It's just not one that I go back to. So okay. it was next on my list. So good pick, John. Congrats. <laughs> Thank you. I will take. I will gladly wind up with this next movie, which is the Nicolas Cage dramedy Matchstick Men. Great choice, Under bud underrated Ridley Scott movie, a great performance from uh, Nicolas Cage and Sam Rockwell, right? And he has, yep. that's him. And yep. then is it Alison Lohman? Is Alison that Lohman. Movie? Yep. Alison Lohman. You know, where, where has she been? She, um, I, I'm, I'm mixed on her in general, but she okay. this was, this was like the highlight for me of her, her career. She mm -hmm. was really good. Um, it was just an interesting movie, an interesting character for Nick Cage. So uh, Matchstick Man is my fourth choice. These are. This is one of those films where you understand that Nicolas Cage is an actor. He's not just a movie star. He's not just a weird, quirky guy. He's a legitimate actor. And watching Matchstick Men, you can see why he's. Uh, and I love this run that he had during this time, like Weatherman and a couple other things around this time were really great stuff. Fam, I thought Family Man was good uh, as yeah. well with him. So yeah, good choice, brother. All right, so that's off the table. So then I, I'm going to do this. Because I know you've got this coming up next, but I'm going to take it. Uh, House of Gucci. I'm putting House of Gucci next. Because I, 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 I don't care what anybody fucking says. I love House of Gucci. I think this is Ridley Scott putting all the walls down and going, fuck it, let's have some fun. And he gets great performances from everybody. And I will battle anybody, including my friend, our friend Dan Merle, about Jared Leto's performance in that movie. I loved him in that movie. I thought he understood the assignment. This was a bio this is a family biopic but with a tongue firmly planted in its cheek for certain moments, although there were some pretty harrowing moments and I thought Gaga was great. I loved her better in this than I did in A Star Is Born. I could see the wheels turning as an actress in A Star Is Born. I could see no wheels turning and her having fun here in House of Gucci. Driver was great as well, perfecting his Ferrari accent which he's using now in the Michael Mann film and just the overall story and Pacino. Oh, Pacino was great in the movie as well. So to me, I will sing the praises of house of Gucci forever, man. Uh, you're correct. That was my next pick. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I also like house of Gucci. I think Jared Leto is great in it. Yeah. Um, so, okay. Let's see. Or uh, I will go with Prometheus next. Oh, okay. Going. Yeah, uh, Prometheus at least was interesting. Okay, uh, not a complete home run, but I just I love what Michael Fassbender is doing in, in this movie. Mm -hmm. uh, Numi is good. There's a, there's some interesting new ideas. It expands the alien mythology and franchise in an interesting way. So, yeah, uh, Prometheus is my pick. Okay, all right, fair point. Um, I will move my next pick, and that is the last duel. I think this is unrecognized, damn good movie from Ridley Scott. You know, see, we see the Marvels people nowadays, the critics or the people who are upset that the Marvels didn't do well. And I think it's all stemmed from the fact that they really like the movie, right? So they, they got to come up with all these conspiracy theories and all these reasons other than the film, why the film didn't do well. But it happens all the time. The Last Duel is a really good movie that made like $5 million at the box office. And it's got a heavyweight cast of talent with Matt Damon, uh, Adam Driver, Affleck, and uh, Jody Comer, and Ridley Scott directing it. And it's a period piece commenting on a real story about a woman who was raped and claimed to be raped and the battle about that told in a Rashomon style. And it completely worked. 
And it's a shame more people didn't go see this movie. And it's because they didn't do get to do interviews or get to publicize the movie or post do you know, cut magazine covers. It's because people just weren't interested in this movie for whatever reason. And sometimes that happens. And this is one of those movies that just grinded for whatever reason under the uh, I don't give a shit bus. And it did, and people didn't go see it. But it is a damn good movie. Um, and I put it on par with Martian. I like The Last Duel. I didn't love it like some critics did, but you know, I thought it really did a nice enough a nice enough job. Again, the story, sometimes the story behind these movies just becomes about the box office. And yeah. Whether they're, you know, a failure or not, and, and and the movie gets lost in the shuffle. Um, but I will take another movie. Okay. Happy, happy to. This I think was maybe one of the, the toughest assignments that any director has ever had. And that is following in the footsteps of Jonathan Demme by doing Hannibal, oh, Hannibal. equal to the Silence of the Lambs. Uh, Definitely, you know that is one of the all-time great movies. Hannibal is not one of the all-time great movies, <laughs> no. But it's a fun one that makes the most of uh, the you know Italian setting and. There are some creative kills, and obviously yeah. it's very memorable with all the Ray Liotta stuff. And it's tough mm -hmm. losing your leading lady. You know, you don't have Jodie Foster. You're, you're pivoting to Julian Moore. Yeah. You know, that, that's a no-win situation, as oh. good as Julian Moore, you know, is in general. But um, Hannibal's not bad. Yeah. I would say yeah. It. There are some really good scenes in Hannibal. I mean, Gary Oldman almost steals the movie, even under all that prosthetic makeup. He almost steals the movie in Hannibal. To me, they lost me is when they're cooking Ray Liotta's brain. That just was one step too far from him. Like, oh, they're just showing off now. Let's see how weird he can be as a cannibal. And so that bothered me overall. But yeah, I hear you and I agree with you that there's no way she was going to fill Jodie Foster's shoes. Um, there's <laughs> it just wasn't going to happen. Oh, uh, yes. Ironically, we have six movies apiece, right? Okay. Yeah, six movies apiece. Okay. So we each have four. What, what were you going to say? Sorry. I was just going to say real quick, ironically, Julianne Moore and, May and Jodie Foster may be battling for Best Supporting Actress uh, here coming up in the in the, in the the Oscars, possibly, uh, for May, December, and uh, Nyad. We shall see. Um, all right. Da, 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 da. All right. So then my next one is uh, All the Money in the World. Uh, I really like this movie. It was a surprise for me because I, I remember going to the screening with my arms folded going like, oh, this is going to bore me. It's going to be one of these 70s films about a rich kid who was kidnapped. What the fuck do I care? but really made you care and really brought Italy to life in that movie and what was happening here made you care about these rich people and the fucked up way they treat each other and the way everything went down between them and the Christopher Plummer situation replacing Kevin Spacey. He was seamless in the film. Uh, and I just was so surprised at how much I enjoyed this movie and cared about the characters and Michelle Williams, yet another wonderful performance from her as an actress lately um, and I just thought top to bottom, this was a film that shouldn't have worked, but I thought I found it to be incredibly interesting as the film was unraveling, uh, uh as it went along. I agree. I think that he was an, obviously in a super tough position on that movie, given everything that happened with Spacey. Uh, yeah. I like that movie. Um, and I think a lot of it is just because it's a fascinating story. Like even yeah. though the execution sometimes isn't always there for Ridley Scott. Yeah. I think he has really interesting story sense. Mm -hmm. he, he, interesting stories. Um, whew, okay, here's an interesting story for my next pick. I'm going to go with Jeff Bridges in White Squall. Wow, White Squall. White Squall is a movie I probably watched a couple of times when I was a kid. I don't think I've seen it since I was like, you know, 12 or 13 years old. But, right. you know, I like the, the the young cast of up and comers. It was like, what, Ryan Phillippe and um, Scott Wolf. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it um, it's an interesting sort of disaster movie survival tale, that kind of thing. We're getting we're getting down there now. Yeah. John. Uh, sorry. Jeremy Sisto. And um, uh, yeah, he was in there. And Ethan Embry. Ethan Embry was another one of the young actors who were in that. So, yeah. And Balthazar Getty was in that as well, which I didn't remember. So, yeah, a good, uh, an interesting film for sure. Stuff on the sea is rarely hits. So this one's an interesting film for sure. Um, all, right. all right. And let's see, where am I at? Oh, you're yeah, at pick 15. So, I'm, oh, so this is my eighth or my seventh pick? You have, you have three picks left. This is, you have eight, eight nine, ten. 
Okay, eight, nine, ten. I'd have to go um, G.I. Jane. That's my next choice. I like G.I. Jane. It's a damn good movie for what it was. And this is Demi still at the top of her game. And this was a pretty controversial film when it first came out. The idea of a female, uh, there was a Navy SEAL here and the things she has to do uh, in order to prove herself and whatever. Or was a ranger. I can't remember. But either way, she's, and then having to fight the government and finding out that like the female senator who recommended her actually only recommended her to fuck her over for her own political benefit. I thought that was incredible. And having a pretty scary Vigo Mortensen there as uh, the uh, drill instructor uh, and going through the shit that he went through, I thought was awesome. And this is Demi like in incredible shape, understanding that she was kind of shattering a ceiling in her own way for women leading films like this. And I thought really directed the fuck out of this movie so that by the end, when everything is uh, kind of playing itself out, you're really on her side and enjoying it instead of feeling like it gets a little cheesy by the end. So I like that. Okay, okay. I like G.I. Jane a lot too. I think G.I. Jane's kind of sexy. 100 percent She was she was sexy, period. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Jeez. I will go. This is where I will take the counselor, actually. I mean Oh uh, god. What? Only because of that Brad Pitt death scene that I like so much. <laughs> I don't love this movie. It's the worst movie, man. Yeah, I don't love it. I don't love this pick, but you know what? It's an interesting failure, and it's got a hell of a cast. All right. I'm trying to sneak one by you, because there's only one other movie I'm interested in, but okay. My number nine? Bill, like you said, he has a great story sense. Like, we as a viewer are like, is he corrupt? Is Douglas corrupt? Is he not? Did he take the money? Well, if he did, is he a decent guy? And so we see these moments where the Japanese uh, police inspector is questioning him and the back and forth. And then, of course, Saito, the actor who played Saito, he killed that role. So awesome. Here I am, Neek. And then when they have the battle at the end there, it's so cool. When he goes to see the Yakuza boss, who's got that very deep, growly voice, that conversation they have. It is a badass 1980s fucking action movie. Uh, and I love it. I love it because it's not really trying to win an Oscar. It's really having some fun with a with a story like this. And I love that movie. Uh, I should have taken Black Rain over the counselor. Uh, <laughs> that. That's 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 my fumble. OK, yeah. um, this movie, I could not tell you a thing about it. OK, I don't remember it whatsoever. Okay. But I'm going to take it because it's a DiCaprio movie and it's just sitting there waiting to be picked. And that's Body of Lies. Oh, OK. You can't say anything about it. All right, I don't. I don't remember a fucking thing about this movie. <laughs> I've never seen it, so I couldn't put You've it on. Never seen it. No, uh, those films. Oscars in it. Hold on, let me check. I think Oscar. I think Russell's in it. in it, right? Russell's in it, isn't he? Oscar Isaac is in it. Yeah, that's that's. Oh, Oscar Isaac. Yeah. Well, right on. Okay. Uh, all right, so then I will take at the bottom of my list because I do think. Direction wise, the battle sequences are amazing. Is Napoleon? I'm not a big fan of the story between Napoleon and Josephine. I thought that was a bit of a letdown. But as far as direction, though, Ridley Scott's direction of the battle sequences, directors who are who are going to do battle sequences in the future should study what he does in this movie. It's incredible how he brings those battle sequences to life, no matter what the terrain, no matter what the situation. So I have to give it up for Napoleon there at number ten, only because you took. A bunch of the other ones that I would have put uh, here at number ten. So, uh, well, I, when you started that whole th thing about battle sequences and stuff, I thought you were going in a different direction. Uh, <laughs> Where'd you think? Was, I will now go uh, okay. and I will end it with the director's cut, if you don't mind, oh. of Kingdom of Heaven. There you go. Nice. That will be my final pick. Um, so yeah, run down your ten again, and I want I want the viewers to be the judge. We'll we'll, we'll okay. read up sentiments later in the show or whatever but so my 10 blade runner gladiator american gangster black hawk down house of gucci the last duel all the money in the world gi jane black rain and napoleon i think that's 10 and i got alien thelma and louise the martian matchstick men Prometheus, hmm. Hannibal, Body of Lies, The Counselor, Kingdom of Heaven, 
and uh, what was the other one I took? White Squall. White Squall. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's an interesting. Oh, and sweat. Hannibal. Hannibal, right? In Hannibal, you put Hannibal. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, well, that was the Ridley Scott movie draft. You guys <laughs> let us know who won, who absolutely dominated, thanks to Alien and, and <laughs> The Martian and Thelma Louise, and who wound up with movies like Blade Runner, uh, which will be lost like years ago. Oh, my God. You're insane. All right. Well, let's take a quick break, and we'll jump into some more of the show here with Nicolas Cage, top five TV show ideas uh, right after this. All right, Jeff, we got 350 people watching us live. Thanks so much for joining us for this impromptu show. We'll be going, we'll be doing two shows a week here. So uh, look out for that going forward in the future here in December. And then we'll be announcing the Patreon. And this show will now, the second show will live behind the paywall of the Patreon for you all to support what we got going on here on the hot mic. And uh, let's get to your Streamlabs and Super Chats real quick. Jeff, um, Aaron says, I think Scream 7, they should just make it a standalone entry and set it in the 1920s. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Love this show and you both rock. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, your thoughts here. <laughs> Why the 1920s? I need... <laughs> who is this? Put them... Can we get them on the show? I need them to elaborate on this. <laughs> Why? Uh, I don't know. Flappers in the 1920s? That just makes no sense for Scream. But why maybe... Would, why would a ghost face have even existed then? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mike McKenzie says, hey, fellas, did you guys check out the latest Grand Theft Auto 6 trailer or is 90 million views in 24 hours not hot enough for y'all? Well, I, I, I'm not a gamer. I've never played Grand Theft Auto, Jeff. I've been a voice in Grand Theft Auto. I think five or four, I played a, a guy at the bus stop um, who was complaining about his weight, uh, which was a nice payday for me. But uh, I've never played any of these games. And I don't know. I might try six. The trailer was great, but I didn't want to do a trailer reaction for something that I've never played. Uh, what about you? Did you watch the trailer? It was pretty cool. Guys, we should have Roga tell the story about how the talent scout discovered him for Grand Theft Auto. He actually <laughs> was at a bus stop that he called home for a little while yeah. complaining yeah. about his weight. Yeah, And someone was like, you should be that guy in Grand Theft Auto. And <laughs> that's what got Roga off the streets. Um, <laughs> I did watch the trailer. It looked awesome i mean yeah. I, is this even a video game anymore is this just like digitized footage essentially like yeah uh it looked like all of florida's worst instincts come <laughs> yes yes <laughs> yeah true very true um yeah i mean i i yeah and what jeff said is very funny but i was at I way more I was at William Morris for, for voiceover, and they got me in for the audition, and I was lucky to book it. It was a lot of fun. I was at William Morris for something else, and then they called security on me. <laughs> Yet again. Get this guy out of the building. <laughs> uh, Justin Toner says, hi, guys. I saw Godzilla Minus One on Saturday and loved it. One of the best Godzilla movies ever. So happy as a longtime fan. A critical and financial success for Toho. They have extended its U.S. theatrical run until December 14th, which is great. There you go. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, Jeff, do you do you find it weird that they drop Godzilla versus Kong: New Empire or Godzilla X Kong: New Empire the same weekend as they dropped um, the Godzilla minus one? It seemed to kind of be at cross purposes. Maybe, but they didn't have a choice, right? I mean, ultimately, yeah. they didn't release Godzilla minus one, right? Someone, yeah, some yeah. other contributor chose that date, and that yeah. date just happened to line up with CCXP, mm -hmm. and Warner Brothers has its own plans there. So uh, a coincidence for sure. Yeah. Maybe it ultimately benefited, though, from the uh, sort of uh, higher profile for Godzilla that weekend. Yeah, the attention. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right, let's hit some stream or Super Chats, rather. Uh, let's see here. Sam O says, hey, I know it's a film show, but thoughts on the GTA 6 trailer? We just talked about that. And if a Grand Theft Auto movie adaptation were made, who should direct and star in it? Well, <laughs> I mean, Michael Bay seems the logical fucking choice to do a Grand Theft Auto movie. Um, do you reunite him with Megan Fox and then maybe get some other dude? I could see that, but Michael Bay seems logical to me, Jeff. What about you? I think Michael Bay is certainly the obvious choice. Like he would yeah. be number one. 
But like, what if it what what if it wasn't Michael Bay? What if Michael Bay came out and was like, you know what? I don't have any interest in doing this. So then okay. it would have been. Then Chad Stahelski. Right, the John Wick guy. I think he would do a great job with Grand Theft Auto Six, especially because it's a you know, whole journey through a city and you're trying to survive in a situation. What about Refn? Oof. Yeah, but would he slide into the pretentious shit? Like, would we get that with who? Nobody wants pretentious shit in Grand Theft Auto, dude. Um, someone is texting me saying, uh, "S. Craig Zoller." Which could be interesting. Someone's saying Verhoeven in the chat. And Ivan Nava went no. to where I was thinking. Harmony Corinne. That is oh, who no. I was thinking, Ivan. But then I was That's like, you know, could he, could he handle like car chases and shit like that? Like, but yeah, maybe. He's a I mean, Yeah. Corinne, I think Corinne's a nice choice. Um, Zoller's interesting because of dragged across concrete. So the harder edge to it. But will he will he embrace the sexuality of the film? That's the thing of the of the game. You got to have women in booty shorts and bikinis and doing all kinds of crazy shit that uh, will offend a lot of women in America. But you know, if you're gonna go dive I into it, a bikini for a role in, in GTA. <laughs> really? Maybe you should be at the bus stop then. Won't you be at the bus stop next time? Dude, a few more weeks, I will be. <laughs> <laughs> John Lee said, what did you guys think of the trailers from CCXP? My favorite, The Boys and Fallout. I'll be curious uh, to see how Amazon does with God of War. Yeah, I thought the trailers were good. I thought the Fallout trailer, for someone who's never played the game, it got me interested in seeing the game. Love The Boys trailer. Like the Godzilla versus, or Godzilla Kong New Empire trailer. I like that as well. What did you think of these trailers here, Jeff? Anything stand out for you or not work for you? Or Oh, and House of Dragons. As well, House of Dragon. Didn't, didn't even watch House of the Dragon. Okay. Uh, the boys, obviously, I'm looking forward to that returning. I love the boys. While that looked yeah. interesting, um, I know that's a big, you know, a big priority for for yeah. Amazon. But what did you think of that title card when it said, you know, from the studio that brought you the boys and, and free two day shipping? What did you think of that? I thought it was who the fuck knows free two day shipping. I know that was not, I thought that was a weird way to approach it with Prime. I mean, I get. They're trying to do a little tongue in cheek, but people want to take this seriously. And I just think it maybe didn't hit the right tone for me. I, I, I just thought I, there's a place to make that joke. I don't know if Fallout is the place to make that joke. Anyways, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I should wait till you after you put the stuff in your mouth to talk. And other such nonsense says, no love for the duelists. Great debut film. Yeah, no, duelists is kind of dated. It's not for me. Did you? Any Never thoughts on the saw movie? The duelists. Oh, okay. There you go. Never saw it. There you go. There's your answer. Um, um, uh, um, <laughs> um, all right. Let's move on to and send in your Streamlabs Super Chats, folks. We only got about maybe 10, 15, 20 minutes left in the show. Um, uh, let's go on Nicolas Cage here, Jeff. Five TV show ideas for Nicolas Cage. Nicolas Cage saying that he um, has kind of open the door in his mind to possibly doing television. I can't remember who he said he saw do television and it really changed his mind on it. Who do you remember? Breaking bad. Oh, that's what, yeah. His kid got him into breaking bad. That's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So I, I think this may be like the top story in the newsletter tonight. Cause I have okay. like so many ideas uh, for, for Nick cage to do TV shows. Okay. Some of them I'd have to like pitch myself. Some of them are remakes of movies some of them are TV shows that actually exist. So uh, I'm going to go first. I'll just throw out an example. Okay? Go ahead. There's a show that everybody wants to come back. Okay. But it's not going to come back because it's too mm -hmm. expensive. Right? Okay. I don't want to make any more episodes of this because it's too expensive for right. the views that it drives. But... What if this show had Nicolas Cage? Go ahead. Either as a new FBI profiler or as a famous serial killer. And the show I'm talking about is David Fincher's Mindhunter. Oh, season three, starring Nicolas Cage. What do you think? That would be great. Would, but where would he be? Would he be, what's his face, his character, like years in the future? Or who would he be? Would he be a new profiler? 
What would be the thing? He's Jonathan Groff's new partner. Oh, you know, Hulk Callany's gone. Maybe like that's that. it. Yeah. Okay. Or, or or Nick Cage is some you know serial killer who they're chasing. You know, I mean, I don't know who he could actually play. Um, mm. and I don't know what he wants to play. Okay. But for some reason, that's where my mind went. Okay. I would love my hundred to come back, and Nick Cage is the kind of star that could justify it. Maybe Netflix spending a little bit more money, knowing that they would get more views. Yeah, yeah. Your turn, John. Somebody said Mike Joyce saying Cage could be John Wayne Gacy. Oh man, seeing I Cage. About is... him. I did think about him as Gacy, as the clown with the makeup. Oh, that could be really interesting. Um, my first choice is uh, a Ryan Murphy produced Hollywood series, like he did with. I think he did Fosse and Verdon and he did the, um, well, we saw on FX Fosse and Verdon and we saw the whatever happened to baby Jane with Betty Davis and uh, Joan Crawford. So something where Cage is playing a producer, uh, a producer who's done these kind of Hollywood movies and what his experience was like trying to get a film to come together. Say he's playing, um, oh God, I can't remember the producer's name who did Gone with the Wind. How do you get the right actors to come aboard to do this film? make it three hours, convince the studio to give you three hours for an epic like this, that kind of thing. I think it'd be a nice challenge for him as an actor to play in a series like that. And it's not that far off of Hollywood, so it could be something that okay. would work. I like where your head's at there, because I think okay. you could do an actually really interesting old Hollywood show with Nick Cage as maybe like, what about him as like gaining a bunch of weight and playing Fatty Arbuckle? Oh, <laughs> interesting. Or... Yeah. More interesting, if you want him to play a producer, yeah, yeah. A producer that he worked with and knew, and have him star in the fucking Don Simpson movie. Oh my god! Yes. Oh my god! Hundred percent. Nick Cage is 100%. doing mountains of blow as Don Simpson. Holy shit! Hundred percent. A hundred percent. But that that's all under your umbrella. Yeah, and good luck convincing Bruckheimer to go along with that. But yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm just I have a list of like 25 shows here so I'm just oh, wow. Picking. Wow. I just picked 5. Go ahead. Okay. Recently in the news, mm -hmm. the fact that Steven Spielberg mm. and Martin Scorsese are uniting once again. Yes. To executive produce with Nick and Tosca mm -hmm. a series remake of Cape Fear. Ooh. What about Nick Cage as Max Cady? That just makes all the sense in the world. That makes oh my god! All the sense in the world. Yeah. Oh my god! Yeah, I don't disagree with you there. That's a great choice. I love that idea. Yep, I love that idea. If you get him, he'd be perfect. I mean, I think he'd love to kind of do his version of that character as well. So yeah, well, I like it. I like it. Um, all right, so my second choice is a sh the shield. You know, Michael Chiklis' show, you do a show like that where he is a kind of like what we saw with Portocol, uh, Bad Lieutenant New Orleans Portocol. Like, have him like this, this detective who can play who's like both sides of the fence or whatever. Having uh, you so you watch him, but like you like him, but you also see him breaking rules and you're not sure how you feel about it. And he could break some taboos that we have about social justice. You know, veering that line between sexism and racism, but also maybe kind of right about certain things because he's telling you how the world actually is, not how we puritanically utopian want the world to be. So I think Cage could be a great guy that people would love to see a show like that. You surround him with fantastic character actors like uh, Walt Goggins was on The Shield, and I think, and CCH Pounder, and I think he would knock that out of the park. Dude. Love it. Have an idea very similar, John. I liked where your okay. head was at with Bad Lieutenant. Yeah, because I was like, "What about if it was Bad Lieutenant meets Ghost Rider, and it was about a motorcycle cop who goes undercover with a biker gang and breaks Ooh. all the rules?" Oh, interesting. So, like Sons so of Anarchy, it but fills he... the Sons of Anarchy void. Yeah, but there's an undercover cop element, Oof. like a Bad Lieutenant. Dude, I like that idea. And he puts him I on like... a motorcycle, which you know, obviously, he you know he's going to go for. Would you? Um, but would okay. you buy him as not the lead of the biker gang? I think that would be the struggle. You would assume that he would be the lead of the biker gang. So he'd be like, know. you know, he'd be like a drifter who's like, oh, I go back decades with Bobby G. Do you remember no. Bobby? G? You know, like, 
Right. And he, he definitely have a bandana. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, bandana for sure. Um, okay, so those are two two ideas a piece. We need three more each. Okay. okay. Oh, so oh, so it's my turn. Okay, so no, I, I, I it's oh, my oh, turn. Sorry, 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 sorry. Yes. I fell under your your umbrella. The bad. Oh, oh I got you. I got you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Umbrella. All right. Nicholas Cage is ready to pack his bags with his family okay. because he's going on a family vacation to the White Lotus. <laughs> that is. Perfect. Perfect. Nick Cage in a Mike White series. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, that's a fucking home run. That's a that's a no sell. If I was the executive in the room, I'd I'd be signing the checks already. That is absolutely a perfect choice. Grab the newsletter, folks. There's gonna be 25 of these ideas coming in a few hours. <laughs> uh my other one, which is a little little bit softer. Um, we saw how James Spader kind of re- um, how can I say this? Reimagined himself, uh, you know, because he played a lot of '80s villains, and Boston Legal, Boston Common. Wouldn't it be interesting to have Nick Cage play a very straight down the middle kind of lawyer who also um, takes on these really weird and interesting cases, and he's the one that figures out how to kind of win these cases where it looks like he's definitely not going to be able to. That could be an interesting thing. You surround him with the right actors. Could be an easy way to him transition into a series that could last for five or six seasons, make his money, and roll on out of there. So if you wanted something safer, that's a way you could go with Nicolas Cage, which I think could really work and uh, be in his wheelhouse. I like it. I like it. Yeah. All right. My fourth idea will be... Mm-hmm. Give me back my son! A series remake of Ransom. Wow. Starring Nicholas Cage. Okay. Well, is he the cop or is he the crop cop? I mean, is he the dad or the crop cop? He could play either, whichever he wants. Maybe he plays both, uh, but he is probably the Mel Gibson role. <laughs> Do you bring back Travolta to play opposite him like face off? <laughs> I would love to see that. All right. So then my fourth choice would be like uh, we've seen what love death and robots or sex death and robots whatever it's called and we saw jordan peele try to bring back the twilight zone well what if you have a series where nicholas cage is introducing twilight zone type a twilight zone type series and nick cage is the one introducing each of the stories and talking to you about each of the stories and then of course at the end coming in to kind of sum up what happened and l- leave with a little final line that's a jab or a zinger and roll on out. I think him hosting a Twilight Zone series would Im- type of series would immediately make that must see TV watching because we all know he's a legendary for his instincts to be kind of out of um, out of pocket, so to speak, out of the box. We're on to something, baby. Nick mm. Cage should be hiring us to just generate these ideas. This is the last one. Now, I just mentioned Cape Fear, right? This is yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're doing series out of Scorsese movies now. This is the point where Hollywood is at. So yeah. nothing is untouchable. Nothing is sacred. Any studio could do anything at any moment, particularly okay. this studio. Okay. Before he met Dirk Diggler, <laughs> what kind of director was young Jack Horner? I'm talking about a Boogie Nights prequel. Starring mm. Nicolas Cage as young Burt Reynolds. Interesting. That well, how did you amass this family of people before Dirk yeah. Diggler entered the picture. I could see that happening because just like Burt Reynolds, um, Nicholas was losing is losing his hair or doesn't have any hair up there, and so uh, he could wear that piece, and that piece could still work even back then. Uh, you could accept it, but I mean. He could yeah, even guess, be the colonel. Even like make him the colonel, yeah, like colonel. you know, like Nicholas Cage in a Boogie Nights prequel. It's just it, it needs that. <laughs> I kind of love that idea, to be honest with you. Uh, I would be so genius. Yeah, yeah, I, I'd be down with that. Um, That's what the second episode of the Hot Mic is. For. <laughs> the first, the first episode is for the news. The second episode is for the genius. Um, all right, so then my last one would be we saw Kiefer Sutherland again, like kind of 
um, how can I say this? Uh, I don't know. Take a second, a second career in essence, or a new phase in his career doing 24 designated survivor. This would be along the veins of national treasure. We, we've seen Nicholas Cage can be an action hero when he wants to be real interesting to see him as an agent of the government <laughs> who is trying to stop this stuff over a, you know, 10, 12, 15 episode series. Uh, and he is involved. He is the guy trying to do all this kind of stuff. Seeing with the axe, seeing with the pistol, the gun, all that kind of stuff. I think it would really work, and uh, he would be easy to believe as like a government agent trying to stop shit from happening. Finding out that some men, people in the government are involved with the plot, how would he break that down? So I think Cage would be a great person at his age now to follow in a series like that. I I liked you know you mentioned twenty four, just like Nicholas Cage is twenty four. What if yeah. they rebooted twenty four with Nick Cage or something like? Just that easy. Good, good shit. It's just that easy. I have so many more guys. Stay tuned to the pot, uh, to the to the newsletter. But yeah, this was this was a fun segment. We'll do more of these. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, what else do we want to talk about today? Anything? Uh, we had one more thing, didn't we? I thought we had one more thing. Uh, hold on. Let me. Oh yeah, what, yeah. Let's let's wrap up with uh, that. Let's take a quick break just so I can put the half hour thing, and then we'll quick wrap break. up. With... Take a quick, 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 quick break. Don't touch the dial. Don't touch the remote. All right, that's quick enough. Let's go into it uh, here real quick. Jeff, you tweeted about this, and I certainly made fun of some lists this morning, which people took a little too seriously. But already, this is what, the fifth day of December? Already critics are coming out with their top 10 movies of 2023. Do we trust that they've seen all these movies to be able to be making these lists? Or is this about getting ahead of everybody else so you can get the clicks? It doesn't make sense to me. What are your thoughts on this? It's 100% that. There's 26 days left in the year. I mean, I, I'm watching the movie almost every day. Yeah. Uh, have they seen Aquaman 2? I don't think so. I guess they have no faith whatsoever in Aquaman 2. Yeah. I'm at least a critic going in with an open mind that Aquaman 2 could be the greatest movie of the year. <laughs> it's probably going to wind up being the 192nd best movie of the year. Yes, it is. <laughs> but nonetheless. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's, it's just way too early. And that is what these last few weeks of, of December are for, to go back and, and look at all, everyone else's lists who yeah. unfortunately published them uh, prematurely and be like, oh, I missed that one. Oh, what is that? Like, where is that available? Can I get my hands on that before my deadline of December 31st? Right. Uh, I, I think it's just, it's ridiculous for any critic to say, you know, I made my best efforts to see as many movies as possible this year when there's still three weeks left. And yeah. there's no way that they saw everything. There's just simply no way. It's impossible. So that's yeah, that's the part of it that I could get caught up in because I'm like, these are the same people who say who denigrate YouTubers who are trying to get clicks and likes for their reviews or their uh, breakdowns or assessments of movies or whatever, and they denigrate them because people who write for these sites consider themselves, you know, uppity critics and above this kind of shit. Yet they're prone to the exact same stuff that YouTubers are, which is their sites go, we got to get our top 10 list out as soon as possible. Put it out there because we got to get clicks and likes and we got ads to run on the site for God's sake. So put it out there. So to me, I find that to be a convenient uh, disconnection that frustrates me when you look at some of these critics putting their top 10 list together when they haven't seen every movie of 2023. Just fucking wait till December 31st or wait till January, the first week of January, then unleash your top 10. It drives me nuts uh, to see uh, critics doing that because, yeah, like I said, they're just doing this for the clicks and the likes and the engagement. And it kind of, to me, undercuts the authenticity of their lists because they haven't seen everything. All these lists feature the exact same movies. It's like the same critics that would publish the list at this point all like the same movies. Yeah. I, yeah. It's it's really – like I, I love when I see a, a list that's like a little bit out there. At least it stands out. At least it acknowledges like a, a unique perspective and point of view. Yeah. Uh, I'm just – I'm blown away by some of the, the choices. And, and like, I mean, May, December, you're really telling me that you think that is the best movie that has come out all year? Like, what? who could think that? Who could be, like, a legit, like, I'm a legitimate film critic. I'm a legitimate tastemaker. This is yeah. my opinion. May, December is the best movie of the year. That's just, like, fucking wild to me. It's wild. Yeah. I've seen so many critics pop up, pop up with that May, December stuff. And I'm like, are you, have you all been 
hypnotized by Netflix to like this movie. Like, I don't understand because I've talked to a number of critics like you who do not like the movie. I've even seen I people. Did, I did. I, John, I like the movie. I okay. like the movie. Who didn't think it was the best picture, I guess. Best, or best film of the year, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Wild. <laughs> <laughs> like, who could think that? Yeah, yeah. I, and, and, it's, and they're the same ones who go like, oh, you people with your hive mind, you only see it a certain way, yet they're part of their own hive mind and slurping on May, December. Or I joked about slurping on the boy who slept with a cow and found God. I've seen those movies and I'm just like, I, what are you talking about? Like, what, what is, I, I get that you want to maybe highlight certain films. I totally respect that. But you have to be honest, like, really, like, you have to factor in what you, I just think in my opinion, you have to factor in what you think are going to win awards, what you think are going to be choices here that people are legitimately going to make to win awards. I don't mind highlighting other films, but you got to be honest in, at the end of the day in how it's factored into everything and what you think is the best. And so I just, oh, I yeah, it's every, no one wants to put themselves out too far on a limb because they'll, they're afraid that they'll be judged by others. So they, they do the safe pick or whatever. Um, I mean, how many critics were like killers of the flower moon? Best movie of the year. Yeah. Like, yeah. for real? For yeah. real? I mean, I can acknowledge that it's maybe features like some of the best filmmaking. Yeah. If you want to go there, you know, like we won't see this kind of filmmaking again for a while. But like, as far as this is the best movie I saw all year, I don't know what to tell you if that's what was your favorite movie. Yeah. Like, I saw yeah. a certain website that you and I both frequent that name is connected to a circle and they a circular object and they have Oppenheimer as an honorable mention of best films honorable mention what the fuck are you talking about so I just go crazy and their number one film is showing up like 10 people saw right. showing up what are you talking about right. Anyone, this is the new thing right showing up this movie that that came and went uh, in the spring, like, oh yeah. my god, you guys should have seen showing up. It was amazing. Like, what? <laughs> These are like the people who put First Cow as, as their favorite movie a couple oh, yeah, years ago. First Cow was another one. The other, yeah, exactly. I like Kelly Riker too, and I like Michelle Williams, but you got to be shitting yeah. me, guys. What, what yeah. is what is wrong with people? I, I, I saw another website who uh, who I love and have usually liked their assessment of films, but Oppenheimer at twenty. And Killers of the Flower Moon up now three or four. And I'm like, there's a difference between a great, well-constructed film and the film that is well-directed. There are two different things. I think Killers of the Flower Moon, if Scorsese gets a director uh, nom, I'm not going to have an issue with it. The story itself, though, the criticisms of the story, how can you ignore that and be like, oh, yeah, this is so great. This is like a top five film of the year. And it's like, I get it that you want to pander to the Native American audience and you know, lash yourself with this whole feeling like, oh, they really told a story that needed to be told shit. But if you don't tell the story correct through the Native American point of view, it doesn't fucking matter. And I think that is what denigrates that film and undercuts it. But it's Oppen incredibly well directed. Just Oppenheimer is a better film than Killers of the Flower Moon. A hundred percent Oppenheimer is a better film. Yeah. Than Killers of the Flower Moon. Yeah. 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 So I don't know. I just feel it odd to see those things. And, and I'm not like absolutely champion smaller films please i love doing that myself and i'm a big fan of discovering smaller films i used to do that all the time before the pressure of reviewing everything was in my life all the time every day i loved going out to the movie theater at shirlington and alexandria where i lived back in virginia and go seeing these smaller films taking a whole day a saturday and watching them one after the other to really enjoy them but at the end of the day i, I just think that you've got to have some semblance of like understanding that there's um, a way to walk the line between both. And I just think it's fascinating to watch so many obscure films on their top 10 lists to kind of almost show off a little bit, it feels like. But yeah, that's just my point of view. Um, but yeah, that's my thing. Um, all right, uh, let's see here. One last uh, stream lab that came, or super chat came through. Uh, W.A. Koss says, Giamatti almost did the Belushi part in Twin Peaks. Um, yeah, I didn't. But I never watched Twin Peaks. So, Jeff, your thoughts on that? Anything? Not a Twin Peaks guy either. <laughs> not, not a Lynch guy. Uh, yeah, neither am I. I'm not a Lynch guy. Lost Highway <laughs> bore me to fucking tears. Uh, Mulholland Drive bore me to fucking tears. Straight best story. Movie, best movie of, the, of my life, man. Best movie of the century. Best movie of infinity forever. Mulholland <laughs> Drive, bro. 
Straight story. That was a good movie. Uh, David Short says, loved your show. I'm a big fan of you and Winston. Thanks. I'm also a Cowboys fan, Alabama Crimson. So I disagree with your take. Free Shoes University has a 55th. Bam, oh, David, you're on the wrong show. Mike McKenzie says, after doing Free Guy and now working on Deadpool 3, isn't Sean Levy the best pick for a Grand Theft Auto movie? No. no. Jeff? Yeah, no. We'll see what he does with Deadpool 3, but he seems a little family friendly to me. Yeah, get too his, family friendly. From the director of The Night at the Museum, Grand Theft yeah. Auto. <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah, no, I don't think so either. Uh, David Short said, just wanted to hand off a little bit more. Oh, thanks, David. And then Parker said, hi, guys. I hope you're both well. John, I am a composer, can write music for the new Geek Buddies segment for free if you still need it. Thank you both for what you do. Oh, I appreciate that, Parker. Um, think about a new theme show uh, or the new theme for this one. Since you're watching the Hot Mic, that could be a fun one for our second show to have a different theme to separate it from our main show. That could be a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, doing, doing that music. <laughs> I like that idea as well. Um, all right, Jeff, anything more we need to cover or talk about here? Oh, We've gotten to hour 15. 48 hours. Relax, everybody. Relax. <laughs> <laughs> yeah we'll be back on thursday talking the news of the week and there's certainly a lot to talk about in the news of the week but let us know what you thought about this particular show this is how we're going to do these uh, second shows more segment oriented more reviews more extensive time on reviews things of that nature and having some fun with you all with these lists and with these uh, uh breakdowns so hope you enjoyed it let us know what you thought what do you want to see in future episodes of this episode of this uh second show we'd love to hear from you all down in the comment section below jeff let people know where you're at and what you got going on if you got any new articles or anything going on in your world the insnider.com slash subscribe www.theinsnider.com slash subscribe and uh look for my stuff on lamag.com uh i i am doing an interview with uh, james patterson that should go up this week so hey keep an eye that's right. nice nice uh yeah the alex cross stuff love james patterson um as for me you can follow me at the roca says on twitter instagram tiktok the outlaw nation on twitch subscribe to the channel down below hit that subscribe button hit that bell button i would really appreciate it if you want to send stuff afterwards uh, for watching the show hit that super thanks button send in some support here for the show as well uh all right until then until thursday we will talk to you next time with another brand new episode of the hot mic take care peace